Hello, everybody. A very warm welcome to today's PCR webinar. Uh, we're today talking about um, how we can minimize the, the risk of conduction abnormalities for uh, mitavi patients. My name is Helge Mollmann from Dortmund in Germany, and I'm here together with Dr. Luis Nombela from Madrid in Spain and Dr. Stefan Tockweiler from Luzern in Switzerland. Welcome, um, you two. Um, we have a couple of points which we would like to discuss today, and the learning objectives is um, to learn how conduction abnormalities impact the clinical outcome for patients after TAVI procedures. Secondly, um, on learn how to correctly estimate the implant depth using the CASP overlap technique. And third, to discuss how to handle conduction abnormalities after TAVI if they occur. For this purpose, we have a life in a box case, which we will um, um, share. And we have a couple um, of discussion points um, that we would like to discuss with you. In order to make the session as interactive as possible, I would like to invite everybody to use the question and answer tool. Um, we will then get your questions and try to answer the questions as good um, as possible. With that, um, we are good to start. And I would like to um, start with the first talk um, on how conduction abnormalities impact the clinical outcome for the patient. And um, Stefan was so nice to prepare this talk. Stefan, what's your opinion on that topic? Yeah, my opin opinion is that uh, they indeed do affect the uh, clinical outcome of our patients. And I will show you some evidence for that. These are my disclosures. So if we look at the impact, I think we can look at the impact on the hospitalization, so the immediate impact. And so we will see that uh, conduction disorders and new pacer and new permanent pacemakers, they do increase the duration of hospitalization. They also increase costs. I show you some data from Lucerne. And of course, then we have to look after the patients if they have a new left bundle branch block. They may need telemetry. The question is how long, of course. And also, finally, they may, may need a pacer implantation if you have a high degree AV block. Then in the long term, of course, and we can say long term is maybe one year, maybe even beyond that, we can see that uh, there might be a, a risk for increased mortality. Maybe not the data is conflicting. I will show you some studies. And we will also see that the recovery of LV fun function is reduced in these patients. So let's uh, first look at the timing of new conduction disorders. And this is our data. It's not published yet. But we can see that in Lucerne, about 24% of patients have a transient or persistent new left bundle branch block. And if we look at the timing, we can see that the vast majority uh, occurs during pre-dilatation and valve implantation, but also some during post-dilatation, of course, some delayed uh, during the hospital stay. Now, if you look at high degree AV block, so second or third degree AV block, we can see that also that most AV blocks occur during pre-dilatation or during valve implantation. But of course, we do have some delayed high degree AV block, and that's, of course, why we need the telemetry in some patients. Now, and this is, again, data that has not been published yet, but I just looked at our database, and, and these are recent data, so only, I would say, second generation valve. And if we look at our data, we increase the duration of hospitalization actually by 80% if we need a new permanent pacemaker. So without the pacemaker, the median is three days. Uh, you can see the interquartile range here. And with a new permanent pacemaker, we have 5.5 days. So it's almost twice as much as without a new pacemaker. And we look if we look at costs, uh, the, the, the cost of the index hospitalizations of the TAVI hospitalization increases by almost 40%. And interestingly, uh, material is only responsible for 23%. But the internal costs that cost, uh, cover uh, nursing and, and blood work and imaging and so on and so forth uh, is actually increased by 70%. This is published data from the UK registry, a very recent publication with a lot of patient. And you can see also here a new pacer or even a pacer that was there before has a, it's associated with a longer duration of hospitalization. Uh, than if you have no pacer at discharge. 
Now, of course, here the difference is not so large, but I would say the overall hospital stay is also quite low. Um, so the effect on the duration is probably less. Now, if you look at the uh, one year data here, impact of new PACER, at one year, we can see all cause mortality is actually not uh, different in this meta analysis. However, if we look at cardiac death, there is even uh, almost significant. Uh, trend, I would say, that favors the implantation of permanent pacemakers. So it appears that the pacer can also prevent from delayed sudden cardiac death. Now, let's look at, at the impact of new left bundle branch block. And here we can see that it is associated with an increase in cardiac uh, death, a new left bundle branch block, as you can see here, 40% increased. And then we can see uh, also that a new left bundle branch block is a risk factor for sudden cardiac death after TAVI. So not only uh, cardiac death, but sudden cardiac death. Uh, you can see that here. And if you look at the uh, different types of new left uh, bundle branch block, uh, we see that those with a very QRS, that's more than 160 milliseconds, are at very high risk for sudden death during the first two years of follow-up. It's an older publication, but very interesting. And finally, if we look at the impact on ejection fraction, we all know that the right ventricular pacing or a left bundle branch block can cause asynchrony. And indeed, we can see that the recovery of LV function here uh, in the group with a new onset left bundle branch block was less than the recovery of LV function in patients with a narrow QRS. This is, again, data from the UK TAVI registry, with, including a lot of patients. And in this study that has recently been published, um, a new permanent pacemaker was associated with a little bit higher all-cause mortality during a up to seven-year follow-up. You can see it, it's really a lot of patients, and you can see the hazard ratio is about 1.14, 1.15. So it's not a massive effect on all-cause mortality, but there appears, if you have enough patients, there appears that you can actually have an effect here and that you can demonstrate averse survival. Now, in summary, I think we have seen that new conduction disorders are associated, of course, with the need for permanent pacemaker implantation and also with the need for telemetry monitoring. And we saw that they increased the duration of hospitalization and costs. And at one year or in the long-term follow-up, it is clear that the new left bundle branch block is associated with increased cardiovascular mortality, especially if it's a wide left bundle branch block with a QRS of more than 160 milliseconds. Then we have an increased rate of sudden cardiac death. And a new permanent pacemaker was actually associated with a lower rate of cardiovascular mortality and sudden cardiac death at one year in some studies. A recovery of LV ejection fraction was reduced in patients with conduction disorders. And overall data on all-cause mortality, I would say also on hospitalization for heart failure is a bit conflicting, is not crystal clear at the moment. But in this large UK study, at least there was a trend or borderline significance that the pacemaker may be associated with reduced survival in the long term. So I think there is still room for research here. Not everything is clear, but if we want to summarize this uh, very simple and very briefly, I think the best thing, of course, for our patients is to avoid both uh, conduction disorders, such as left bundle branch block or AV block, and implantation of a new permanent pacemaker. And I think if we're moving towards a younger population, this topic becomes even more important. So that would be the first part. I think we can discuss that later, uh, but now it's a real pleasure um, the, that I can announce a, a recorded live case. And this case was recorded um, in Dortmund at the St. Johannes Hospital and was performed by the team of Helge Möllmann and his colleagues. Welcome to the hybrid OR in the St. Johannes Hospital in Dortmund in Germany. We are here today to um, implant a Nevitor valve um, in an 82-year-old patient. Um, we would like to highlight some special aspects 
on how to minimize uh, the risk of conduction disturbances during our procedure. Um, before we start, I would like to introduce you to the team. We have uh, Benjamin who is helping us today. Johannes Blumenstein is going to do the case. My name is Helge Möllmann. And now I think we are ready to go. Johannes, would you be so nice to introduce us to the patient? Yeah. Hello, also from my side. I'm happy to give you some information about the patient. So we have an 82 years old female with uh, symptomatic severe aortic stenosis. She suffered from cervical occlusion disease and from a stroke in the year 2000. And this ends up in an SDS score of 6.8%. The physical status, she is slightly reduced in the daytime. She is suffered from dyspnea, NIHA class 3, and she has a bit of peripheral edema. I would like to highlight the ECG from the admission. She has a sinus rhythm with a heart rate of 90 without any conduction disturbances. The echo showed a normal LV and RV function. She has a high flow, high gradient aortic stenosis with a P-mean of 40 and a P-max of 60 millimeter of mercury. The non-invasive evaluation with the CAT scan showed us an annular size of 21.8. She has a regular calcified aortic valve. The aorta showed a straightforward aorta without any severe kinking. The distance to the coronaries is far enough, so we don't have or we don't expect any problems with the coronary arteries. The LVOT showed no calcification, which is important for us to know when we want to highlight on the conduction disturbances. We revealed the co-planner and the cusp overlap view from the CAT scan, which we want to highlight during the procedure. The coronary angiography showed uh, coronary artery disease, which needed two PCIs in the July of this year. So for the procedure, we planned a transfemoral transcatheter aortic valve implantation. We pe will perform a predilatation with an OSIPCA 20 millimeter balloon. We decided for a Navitor 25 millimeter and the vascular closure will be performed by using a Proglide device. So let's start the case. Actually, we prepared already um, a little bit. So we have a sheath on the left groin, a venous sheath and an arterial sheath. We used the arterial sheath to um, get a clear picture of the right artery. And now we try to puncture at a um, sweet spot um, around in the, head of, uh, in the height of the femoral head. So now we are using the ProGlide system for pre-closure of the arterial puncture. We are usually taking only one proglide. And in case uh, there is a residual bleeding after the procedure, um, we take an angioseal in order to fix um, that. For crossing the um, stenotic aortic valve, we usually first take a pigtail. Um, because in uh, most cases we are um, successful with the pigtail and it's a more atraumatic way to pass uh, the aortic um, valve in comparison to an um, amplatz left. And as you can see here, it only takes a couple of seconds um, to pass the stenotic valve with the pigtail. And now we can use the pigtail to exchange for a safari wire which will then give us um, a good stability during the implantation of the valve later on. A very important step is to check whether the angulation um, which was seen in the CT is also correct here in the hybrid OR because the patient is uh, lying a little bit different um, from the CT table, of course. That's why we now check for the coplanar view and the three cast view, whether we are really um, in a good angulation. So we first start with the classical um, three cusp view and you can easily see that we have a nice perpendicular line. The pigtail um, is placed in the non-coronary cusp in the middle is the right coronary cusp 
and then of course on the upper part uh, the left coronary cusp. So this angulation is fine for the three cusp view. We now change for the um, cusp overlay. The cusp overlay shows us the right and left um, cusp in one plane and this is usually in the RAO corridor. And again, um, the CT was right, as you can see here. The pigtail still is in the non-coronary cusp, and then you can see both right and left cusp just um, over each other. At this point, we would like to stop um, the live in the box case for a, a couple of minutes in order to discuss on how to um, best implant a given device um, in order to minimize um, the conduction disturbances. Um, so what we just learned from uh, Stefan is uh, that the best thing, of course, is to avoid any problems. Sometimes it's not really possible, but um, there are different points which we can really do in order to minimize the problem. And one of those points is to yield for a very high implantation. We know for all devices um, that a deeper implantation is usually associated with a higher rate of uh, pacemaker afterwards. And um, what what technique may help us to overcome this problem? Which technique um, might be helpful to um, um, get a perfect high implantation? Um, this is one of the uh, major questions. Stefan and Luis, um, what, what is your take on, on this question? I mean, of we are now implanting uh, self-expanding valves uh, exclusively almost except for the for the accurate uh, we are using the cusp overlap and i think it has actually as you point out it has uh, three advantages one is that we open up the lvot there is less foreshortening we can see the distance uh, more precise we have the second is we have only one reference point and that this is the non-coronary cusp there is no overlap and the third is that usually we also have a coplanar view of the annulus and the valve so there is no need for adjustment and I think honestly this this uh, the cusp overlap for me is a game changer in Taui and it's amazing that it took us so long to to come up with the, the idea has been around but it has just there was no breakthrough I I'm I'm a total fan of this this view Actually, we started like like ten years ago. Uh, usually, with the cusp overlay um, view, this was a little bit by chance, I guess. Um, then um, everybody took um, the three cusp view for years and years, and now we are learning the beauty of of this new old approach, and um, probably doing um, a really good job for the patient. Louis, um, same opinion. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, we start at this view in in all the in all type of valves and of course here as uh, you have said the for shortening of the lvot is less than in a lao view and you can always control when you place your pigtail deep in the non coronary cusp uh, you can control your very in a very accurate uh, way you can control the 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 deep of, of your implant. Uh, you can also try to not to go very deep during the implantation. So this is also another important thing that you can try to start very high and keep this position uh, during the whole implant. And then you also because uh, sometimes you can with all the delivery systems you can touch the conduction uh, system, and this also can be traumatic for the conduction system. Um, in order to avoid that, do you think that we need a special technique also for, for the wire? Because the wire always leads um, the delivery system, um, in most cases, at least um, close to the conduction um, system. Um, may it be helpful to perhaps change this technique a little bit, Luis? We, we haven't 
We haven't changed. I mean, we use pre-shaped wires uh, for almost all the all the tabby cases. I know that in other centers they use a stiffer wire to to keep this like a rail, and you can control the the, the valve uh, quite good. But we have good experience with uh, the Safari wire or with uh, another pre-shaped wire. So we haven't changed in in this. Uh, I mean, if you have, I mean, if you don't have very uh, tortuous aorta. You can uh, you can still do a very high implant with a, with a safari. With I would say it's a medium or stiff wire, but it's not the stiffest uh, wire in the in the market. Uh, Stefan, I, I think the the rebirth of a cusp overlap is perhaps a little bit driven by um, a um, better by better um, delivery catheters. So the newer systems um, are more stable during the, the whole procedure and you do not have to rush as fast as you had perhaps before. There is not so much uh, um, diving into the ventricle nor the risk of popping out is so high. So you can go much slower and, and find the perfect position um, much, much better. Um, is this also, your impression, how do you use the, the properties of the new delivery catheters um, in order to, to really get the best result for the patient? No, I, I fully agree. I mean, uh, overall, the reduction in pace rate that we're seeing now um, is, is, of course, is driven by many different factors. It's not only the cusp overlap, but the cusp overlap, of course, is a very important part. I think, you know, uh, I mean, we also have to be careful not to aim too high. There is always a risk of pop out if you have an extremely calcified valve, for example. And but I think what the cusp overlap helps is that you you get you actually know the the, the position, whereas before you were honestly we were actually not sure. We implanted the valve, we did an injection, we thought oh we're at three or four or five millimeters, but maybe it was actually wrong. We were actually at at uh, seven or eight millimeters, but now we know that we are at three millimeters. So I think we have to be careful if we aim for zero. We sometimes do that. Uh, for example, if you have a patient with a pre existing right bundle branch block, or if you have a patient with a very short membranous septum, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, then we may be very ambitious and aim for a super high implantation. But I think in general, if we aim for two, three millimeter implantation depth of these valves, uh, we have a very good result and a very low risk of a, of a high degree AV block. We have now been talking about the cusp overlap technique quite a bit. And um, I think now it's really important to make you a little bit more familiar with the theoretical background of that. And uh, Louis was so kind to prepare two slides, um, which help us to, to better understand what we are doing in the cusp over uh, lab technique. And afterwards, we can continue with a case uh, which will perhaps um, give some additional hints on how cusp overlap technique can um, easily be performed in the cath lab at home. So, Louis, perhaps you can uh, share the two slides and then give us some more insights in, in the technique. Yes. So, here in the picture, you can see that in the CAS overlap view, we aim to see the left and the right in the same plane. So we are watching uh, overlap this sinus, and we are leaving at the left part of the of the screen the non coronary CAS. So here also you can also use this uh, view to adjust your your valve uh, orientation. And also, you you know that one of the commissures has to go to the to the right of the of the screen, and the other two commissures to the to the left of the of the screen. So uh, here in the in the view, you you can see also in the in the video in the right part that we are isolating the non coronary cusps, and the left and the right are overlap. Why are we using this? Because uh, you know that the Conduction, that the conduction system is uh, close to the close to the non and the right coronary cusp, and the membranous system is uh, membranous septum 
is 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 uh, right in the commissure of the uh, non coronary cusp and the right coronary cusp and uh, we know from several studies that if the membranous uh, septum is long we have we can we can i mean we have uh, can have a more deep implantation but if the membrane system is quite short we have to or we have to try of course with the consideration and with the risk of uh, of uh, to have of a pop up uh, we have to to try to to implant the valve as much as i as, as possible so you know that the left uh, branded branch uh, uh, branch uh, is going here through the through the muscular uh, septum, and we don't try we don't want to to touch uh, to trauma trauma this uh, this part of the of the septum. Maybe we can continue with the with the video and see how can we achieve a high implantation using this uh, view. And now we are. Um pretty well prepared for the next steps and um, before um, continuing with the balloon um, valvuloplasty um, we would like to discuss shortly which size of balloon we choose and why we did so. So Johannes, um, which size did you use and what is um, the rationale behind? So the CAT scan revealed an annulus of 20 1.8 so we decided to take a balloon of 20 millimeter the reason for that is we don't want to interrupt too much with the AVOT as you've seen before there was no calcification in the AVOT at all so we don't want to give too much pressure on the AVOT due to conduction disturbances then we are good to go with the balloon we usually take a transvenous pacer um, still the um, old-fashioned classical way um, so this is placed from the groin um, to the right ventricle. We already checked the pacer, it's working uh, probably. Therefore, we are now good to go for a short period of rapid pacing and the balloon valvuloplasty. And the pacer, please. If you now have a look on the ECG, you can see that we still do not have any alteration of the QRS complex. So um, obviously the uh, valvuloplasty did not interfere too much with the LVOT, which nicely shows us uh, that the balloon size was probably correct. Okay, now we have prepared everything for the valve implantation and start only a couple of millimeters below the annulus. Perhaps we can highlight it with a little bit of dye. You can see we are at around two millimeters. The Navitor valve um, has not the tendency to dive towards the ventricle. If there is a tendency at all, it goes up a little bit. Therefore, you should not start um, above the annular level. For the first couple of millimeters, we use the cusp overlap view. So what you can see here in this image is the pigtail in the non-coronary cusp and the right and the left cusp are on the other side um, and are above each other. But we only concentrate on the non-coronary cusp in um, the beginning of the release of the valve. Okay, we slowly go on. The beauty of this system is that we have all the time of the world. If there is any arrhythmia we could pace a little bit but in this patient we have a very stable um, rhythm at the moment so we do not um, see the necessity to pace. While Johannes is slowly releasing the valve you can see it's flaring a little bit. And we are in a really good position, very, very high. Okay. Now we are good to go to change uh, the angulation a little bit because we would like to have a perpendicular view on the valve. And it's very important to, to highlight that we made sure that we are in the correct position on the non-coronary cusp and now check again 
on how it looks on the other cast. Okay, we are very, very high, but that's where we would like to end up. Therefore, we go slowly forward uh, with the release. The system, the delivery catheter is nicely in the middle of the aorta. There is no push nor any pull on the system, um, which is really good. Good for the final release. We check once more and then remove the pigtail. We have to make sure that the catheter, the delivery catheter, detaches from the valve properly. Okay, but we are now free. What we are doing next is to remove the pre-shaved wire, which will centralize the nose cone and helps us to um, get it out of the ventricle without any interaction with the valve. So this is the first root shot we did after implantation of um, the valve. And there are a couple of things which we would like to highlight. First, we still have a little bit of um, regurg. Second, we have to have a look on the um, hemodynamic, which is really nice. You can see a diastolic pressure of above 60, um, which again shows us that um, we um, yielded a very good hemodynamic um, result. Um, third, we have, of course, to have a look on the ECG because our task was to um, implant the valve without any interaction to the conduction um, system. And obviously, this was successful. The, um, we still have the sinus rhythm. We still have a very uh, narrow QRS complex. Heart rate is about 80. Therefore, we are pretty happy with that. There is no need for pacemaker. What we are doing next is to remove the system and to remove the wire from the ventricle in order to recheck whether we really have a good result without a significant paravalvular leak. This now shows us that we have a little bit of paravalvular leak. So at this point, we have to stop again. Um, you saw the implantation, um, which I would like to discuss first with the um, two discussants here. And um, then we, of course, have to discuss whether we are really happy with this um, result and, and, and how to um, proceed best uh, with the procedure. Um, first of all, um, I would like to come back to, to the implantation. Um, so this uh, Navitor valve, you, you could, uh, I think, easily see um, that it was pretty easy to implant in a very um, high position. It was very stable during uh, the release. We um, had enough time to check in different angulations whether we are really happy with the um, implantation depth. And um, so we probably ended up with an implantation depth of perhaps one, perhaps two millimeters. So it was really a very um, high um, implantation. Um, is this way of implanting exactly the way you're doing it as well, um, Luis? Yes, uh, we start as, as we you have done in the CAS overlap view. And then this is, I think, this is a very important message uh, to take that first at the beginning, we are starting this view. And then when the valve is touching the left side and is flaring and is uh, already touching the, the other part of the, of, the, of, the, of the annulus, then you have to move to a, another view and also check the position and the implant depth in, in other views. So we usually start in an LAO caudal, the cast overlap view, and then we move to an LAO caudal or LAO cranial and see how is the uh, implantation depth in the, in, the left, in the left side. So we adjust and you, we use a, a coplanar view for the valve, for the stem of the valve. And then if we are happy, we continue with the, with the, with the implantation. As you know, this, this valve can be uh, uh, received, can, can be repositioned. If you are not happy with the position, you have to remove all the, the tension. And if you are not happy, you can uh, receive and uh, start the, the implantation again. I think this is a very important point um, that uh, we always have this um, 
a safety net, um, so to say, um, if we are too high or too deep or whatsoever, um, that we can redo more or less the whole procedure. On the other hand, um, uh, Stefan, if I understood you correctly, and then in one of your first slides was this um, image, when a left bundle branch block occurs, probably um, it's not the uh, best idea to start like five times. Um, how would you discuss uh, this issue? I mean, yeah, I think this was a really high implantation new uh, in this case. And I think it's, it's good uh, if there is not heavy calcification, which was not present here in this patient. I think the problem is you know, if, if the radial force is, is maybe borderline and there is heavy calcification, then it's actually, it, you, it can be a risk to implant that zero millimeters. So I would not uh, advise that. Um, also, I mean, it's interesting that you're doing, uh, you're going back a little bit to the traditional three cusp uh, projection before release. We actually don't do that. So we keep the, the cusp overlap view. I know other centers who do the same, but I think it's sort of a you know personal preference, and of course you it's always nice to see a, a final shot that you actually know or that you're used to. Uh, maybe once we have really integrated the cusp overlap in routine for years, then we will not switch to other projections. I personally think it's not necessary at all, and we don't do it. How do you make sure that um, you are correct on the left coronary cusp? Sometimes um, this is a little bit hard to see in the, in the cusp um, overlap, uh, at least at, uh, that's uh, my opinion, but um, I may be wrong. So how, how do you make sure that you're not only perfectly positioned in the non-coronary cusp, but also yeah. in the two others? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, this is a good point, but you can still see it. At least you see the, the commissure between the left and the right uh, coronary cusp, of course, on the right side of the screen. Um, if the, the position on the non-coronary cusp is already very high, I'm, I'm happy because the conduction system is there, is between the non and the right coronary cusp and not between the left and the, the right coronary cusp. And, and also the ceiling will usually be no problem, although you may not have to completely uh, same angle of the of the of the annulus and the valve, but uh, there will be no problem. I think there is an exception if you're, let's say, you you end up at five millimeters, or you you think it's acceptable, but maybe not perfect. Then I also check at, at other projections to make sure that we have a good position in the at the left coronary cusp as well. But I would say this is like ten percent of our implants, and and usually we stay in this cusp overlap view. Or we also adjust it a little bit if we see that the valve is really in a different orientation, like we don't have this co uh, coplanar view, then we may adjust the view a little bit. I, can I ask you something, Helge? Um, because I, I found it very interesting. Uh, you did single operator Tavi pretty much. And is that yeah, something please. that you do uh, with the Navitor or with other valves? Or is, do you think that's going to be the future? Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm um, doing that with the Navitor device in all cases, um, uh, with the Evolute as well. Um, of course, not with the Accurate. This is more or less impossible to, to turn the knob and then uh, at the same time hold the, the um, device um, in place. Um, but I really prefer to, to do it single-handed um, because this is the only way to know how much tension is on the wire. Is there any push, any pull whatsoever? So I have the feeling that I have the complete control um, on this um, procedure. I may be wrong, but uh, that's the way I'm doing it for years now. And, and um, we met quite good um, experience with that. <laughs> okay. And is there even a second operator at the table or are you yeah. also alone from the beginning to the end? No, no, there is always a second operator on the table. Um, and um, just in case there are any problems, I'm, I'm of course happy if, if there is a second um, operator. It's really for, for, for the purpose to, to have the 
complete control during the release. Um, this is the idea uh, behind that. And um, the, the new system, the new delivery catheter um, for, for the Navitor device is very, very stable. And therefore, um, you have really enough time. And um, this really helps to, to um, find a perfect uh, position of, of the device. And um, here, again, I, I feel that it is uh, easier to, to um, have, the, um, have it as a single operator. Yeah. There is one question so from the audience. Um, perhaps um, I, I can um, just uh, ask you two, how do you measure the depth of the implantation and do you do it routinely before the final deployment? Well, yes, of course we do it uh, before the final deployment. Uh, as I said, I usually change from the cast to the left uh, view, but uh, then at for the final deployment, we came back to the to the CAS overlap view and, and we continue if we are happy. We measure, you know, that the the stance of the valve, the, the, the target for this valve is eight millimeters. You have you have this uh, for the for the pericardium ceiling, but uh, of course we aim to to usually to implant the valve at two or three millimeters. You can you can calculated uh, directly for, for the angio and we keep the pigtail until the end of the of the implantation in the in the uh, in the non coronary cusp and the mode of measurement i'm i'm always using the diamonds for which i exactly know um, how, how how large they are and um, this gives us a, a good feeling um, uh, how deep we are um, in the annulus there is one more question, not from the audience, but from my side. Um, um, for for the case, uh, we ended up here with a little bit of aortic regurge. And um, first, I tried to avoid the post dilatation and therefore um, continued um, with releasing um, the wire. And just a second. I was disturbed here. Sorry about that. Um, I, I um, removed the, my, uh, the wire and tried to um, get the perfect result. No, that was not the absolute perfect result. There was still some degree of regurg. And now we had to make the decision on either to continue like this, accepting a little bit of regurg, or go for a post dilatation. And again, um, Stefan. Um, showed us nicely that a post dilatation will increase the risk of conduction disturbances a little bit, but yeah, it will increase. Bit, yeah. What would you um, accept um, the regurg or the risk of conduction disturbances, Stefan? It depends. I mean, it's a it's a actually a individual decision. I think if the patient is older, then you can accept maybe a mild to moderate leak. Or if the patient has pre-existing regurgitation and the ventricle is already dilated, you can also accept that safely because the patient will tolerate it. On the other hand, if the patient has a very small, stiff ventricle, like a hypertensive heart disease or amyloidosis, then um, even mild regurg can be a problem for the patient later. And, and it also depends on the conduction disorders and, and on your how if you already have a new left bundle, you may also be more cautious. And last but not least, we have to um, also keep in mind that these are self-expanding nitinol valves and, and they keep on uh, expanding uh, sometimes during the first 10, 15 minutes. So sometimes it's, it's really, it, it helps if you wait just for 10 minutes and we can gradually see an increase in diastolic pressure. And, and uh, you also measured the pressure and you said it's 60, which is already, I think, a quite nice result. And what I also do is simultaneous measurements. If I have the pigtail in the ventricle and, and there is no increase in pressure during diastole in the ventricle, that also shows that, that it's usually no problem. Um, I think there it's very, I mean, it's always a good team discussion whether or not you aim for the perfect result or if you accept a mild leak. Uh, I think a moderate leak these days we are not going to accept, but the question is always with the mild leaks, right? And and we had a mild leak, and and we did exactly what you just proposed. So we discussed quite a bit 
like five minutes, uh, which mm -hmm. then gave the, the valve a little bit of time to, to perhaps um, expand further. But to be honest, um, the situation did not change completely. And therefore, we decided to go on. And perhaps we can show this in the last uh, two minutes of our life in a box case. Now we have to change um, our way of thinking because um, we do not want to accept any paravalvular leak, and I'm sure with the sealing mechanism of the Navitor um, that we will achieve a, a more perfect um, result. Therefore, we decided to um, go again into the left ventricle and um, post dilate once, and then probably we'll have the perfect result. Still no gradient, of course, um, but no paravalvular leak anymore. Now I'm going to dilate the valve, which nicely opened. So what you can see directly after the balloon valvuloplasty that there was a, an increase of the QRS complex, um, which usually um, recovers very quickly. So we wait for two or three minutes and then check again. We have still sinus rhythm um, with the same um, heart rate as we had before. So we are confident that this will um, resolve more or less. There's only a very minor um, QRS increase um, sinus rhythm, heart rate is still absolutely um, stable. Therefore, um, we are pretty happy with the result. Um, no regurg, no conduction um, system disturbance, and um, a very good hemodynamic. Okay, <clears throat> you can easily see there is no bleeding, there is no stenosis at the puncture site, so we are happy um, with that. In the meanwhile, the ECG is completely normal. With that, I would like to thank the whole team for helping us here in the hybrid OR um, for this um, nice case with a very good result. Um, that's it from Dortmund. Thank you very much. So this was um, our um, approach to, to um, solve this problem. So we decided for post dilatation, um, um, we already discussed whether it, it is necessary or not. Um, in, in this patient, we um, had the feeling that we would really um, like to minimize um, the regurg, uh, which was uh, possible with the post dilatation. What we now have to discuss is um, not every case has a um, result like this. In some cases, we do have um, a new left bundle branch block. In some cases, we do have a new AV block, which then needs um, some sort of treatment. And how to handle these conduction abnormalities after TAVI, this is the purpose of the next talk, um, which will be given by Luis Nombela. Thank you, and of course, uh, our aim, like like in this case, is to try to prevent conduction abnormalities. We know that uh, this can have an impact on the on the quality of life and mortality in long term. But sometimes uh, it they can happen. We know that the occurrence of conduction disturbance has not decreased over time, especially when we change from first generation to second generation. Valve and of course there are groups that there are a very high risk uh, patients to to suffer conduction abnormalities like patients with with baseline right bundle branch block and we know how and we have to know how to manage the problem was like uh, that uh, back a uh, couple of years ago there was a lack of consensus on how to manage these problems. And there were major differences between centers and study. It was highly variable how to when to implant the pacemaker, how to manage a new onset left bundle branch block, or also patient with baseline right bundle branch block. This was a survey that we participated in 2016, and you can see here how was how variable was the the management of of the temporary pacemaker and also the uh, new left bundle branch block. A couple of years ago, uh, uh, there was a consensus uh, published in, in JAC and the uh, leader, leader by, by the group of uh, Canada and Quebec. And they highlight that it's very important to maintain the telemetry during the hospitalization and to do an ECG at the end of the procedure. 
they define a significant change in the ECG if the PR interval or the QRS complex was, uh, uh, had an increase of 20 milliseconds. They divided the, the patients in five groups. The, the group that they don't have any changes, like in the, in, in the case that we have uh, seen, and uh, no baseline right bundle trunk group. This is the group one. And the group two is no ECG changes after the procedure, but the patient has a right bundle run block. Then we have uh, the group three are the patients that they have an increase in the peer interval or the QRS, more than 20 milliseconds. Then the group four is the new onset uh, left bundle run block. And then the group five are the patients that they have a high degree AV block. Of course, in the group one and group five are, are the more easier uh, to, to manage. And the group three and four are the gray zone that uh, there are more, um, more questions uh, about how to handle this, this space. Group one is the, is the one that they don't have any ECG and you can safely remove the temporary pacemaker at the end of the procedure maintain the telemetry during the uh, hospitalization, and you can safely discharge this patient at 24 hours after the procedure if there is no change in the ECG. What about patients with no ECG changes but a baseline red bundle branch spot? You have to be a little bit more cautious with these uh, patients. Try to avoid the prophylactic, prophylactic pacemaker before the, the procedure, but maybe we should keep the temporary pacemaker uh, during the first uh, day. And if, of course, if a complete AB block appears, they go directly to, the, to a permanent pacemaker implantation. And if there are no changes, we can uh, keep the patient two, two more days in the hospital and discharge the patient home. If there are some changes, we have to move to other group. Then group five is the, the other one with, uh, with a high degree AB block. Most of the of the of this uh, occur during the procedure, so 80% are periprocedural and 20% are uh, delayed AB block. If the if the AB block persists at the end of the procedure, usually a pacemaker, uh, we go directly to a pacemaker. Then the time of how long have have to wait? We have to wait is around one day, 12 hours, 36 hours but uh, usually most of these patients, they go to a pacemaker. If the, the uh, AB block is transitory, we can uh, keep, the, or we should keep the temporary pacemaker for, for one, one day more and see what happens. If there is no recurrence, you can discharge uh, the patient uh, at, at two days uh, post, uh, post tower. And of course, if they, they occur again, you, you will go to a pacemaker implantation. If they, there is no other recurrence, but uh, other changes, you, have, you will have to move to the group number three. And if there is a delayed uh, high degree AB block, you will go to a pacemaker. What about group uh, three, which are patients with an ECG change, an increase in the PR or QR, QRS more than 20 milliseconds? These are a little bit more complex. You should keep the temporary pacemaker uh, during 24 hours. And if they regress or there are no more changes with a QRS, QRS less than 150 or a PR less than 240, then you can discharge uh, this, this patient. But what happens if they continue to increase the ECG changes uh, or uh, the, Q, the final QRS is more than 150 or a PR more than, more than 240? you should maintain the temporary pacemaker 24 hours. And if they continue with changes in the ECG, these are uh, patients with a very high risk of AB block and you should consider an electrophysiology study or uh, a implantation of a subcutaneous or transcutaneous holder. So in some, also in some cases you can implant uh, directly a pacemaker. And then the, this is the, the most frequent conduction abnormality, which is the new onset left bandage blood block. This, uh, in these patients, if you have the ECG after the procedure with this uh, conduction abnormality, you, can, uh, you should 
keep the pacemaker during 12 or 24 hours and see what happened. If they revert to, to normal uh, rhythm, then you can safely discharge this patient at day two post-procedure. Uh, and what if they stabilize in a, yeah, but the patient is still have the left bundle branch block, but the QRS is not so, so wide or the AV block is less than 240, you, you can discharge the patient, but probably with consider a, a continuous ECG during the, during the following uh, weeks. If the QRS is more than 150, then Again, these patients are a high-risk uh, patient for AV block. And then if there is a progression of the left vulnerable blocks, it's the same situation that you should maintain the temporary pacemaker. And if they have an AV block, a pacemaker will go. And then if they continue to have uh, changes in the ECG, you should consider an electrophysiology study or an ambulatory monitoring of the ECG. And my, li uh, my last slide is this one that also these are the ECG guidelines that they summarize the same that the patients with a, with a high degree AB block or pre-existing right bundle block block with changes, you should uh, uh, implant a permanent pacemaker. But uh, in, in patients with, uh, with a change in the, in the, in the QRS more than 20 milliseconds or with a final QRS of more than 150 or 240, you should uh, consider an ambulatory ECG monitoring or an electrophysiology study. And this is very important that you should perform this study more than three days uh, after the procedure and when the uh, conduction abnormalities have stabilized. And of course, also the, the last recommendation from the guideline is that to use the prophylactic permanent pacemaker in patients with a right bundle branch block baseline prior to the procedure is not indicated to, to implant a permanent pacemaker. Thank you. Perfect, Luis. Thank you very much for um, this um, really good overview um, on when to implant a pacer and um, when perhaps to avoid um, a pacer in these patients. I think it um, is very important to highlight the possibility of a, the EP study um, in order to, to make a better decision uh, whether to implant or not. Do you regularly do that? Uh, yes, uh, if the patient is at very high risk, uh, we we usually do this because uh, um, also you can implant a, like a reveal or a subcutaneous uh, halter, but this is only diagnostic and then you don't know uh, when an AB block is going to happen. So, of course, you are going to see this retrospectively. But if the patient has dynamic changes in the ECG and you have to monitor, monitorize the ECG like every day and have the patient in with telemetry, we we usually do a, a electrophysiology study, and uh, and then we decide if the HB interval is less than seventy, we are safe to discharge the patient maybe with a with a halter. But if the HB uh, interval is more than 100, you sh we usually go for, for a pacemaker implantation. In between is uh, also difficult the decision. Yeah. Stefan, you, you have um, showed us in uh, your first talk that the main problem probably is uh, the left bundle branch block. So it's not so much the pacemaker itself, but the, the uh, left bundle uh, branch block. Um, if we take this, um, why don't we go for a CRT implantation afterwards? So this might overcome the problem, isn't it? Yeah, it, it might. And um, I mean, it's a very good point. If you have a reduced ejection fraction and the patient is not 90 years old, I think it's actually really reasonable to directly implant the CRT uh, if you're afraid of, uh, of, of, of course, of high degree AV block. Um, I think in general, you know what? What I, I mean, honestly, these these uh, recommendations, I think they're a little bit complicated. I'm a more simple man, and also I think COVID has maybe changed um, the way we we um, we we make these decisions because our intermediate care or, or uh, ICU beds are really scarce, 
And so what we now do is if we have a, an AV block and we think our implantation is not zero millimeters or so, we actually implant the pacemaker right away. So we keep the patient on the table and the electrophysiologist, we, we give protamine and we will implant the pacemaker right away. And then we can still safely discharge the patient uh, 48 hours after the procedure. With that, we are already coming to an end of um, our today's webinar. Um, so we uh, discussed um, the possibilities on how to um, overcome conduction um, system disturbances after tower procedures. And what we learned is uh, that we should always yield a very high implantation, not too high, of course, but a high implantation. And in order to um, um, avoid any interaction with the conduction um, system, the cusp overlap technique may be helpful because it gives us a perfect visualization um, of the uh, septum of the LVOT and may help us to find a nice um, um, placement for, for the valve. Um, in case uh, we have some um, conduction disturbances after the implantation, we have to make a smart decision on when and um, when to implant a pacemaker or not to implant a pacemaker. And um, Luis gave us some hints, which may be a good idea. When do we, uh, when can we wait for a couple of hours? So this um, perhaps helps us navigating through this whole issue of pacemaker around um, tower procedures, which thank God have, be, uh, have declined during the last couple of years, which will definitely help to improve the outcome of our patients. I would like to thank the two um, speakers um, for this nice um, discussion. I would like to thank you for participating in this webinar. Have a nice evening. Goodbye. Thank you.